Welcome back to the show. We're about to learn the secret sauce. Cool. So, Lee, thanks so much for making the Uber ride all the way across town. <laughs> yeah. um, you're almost... I guess you've been here so often that you're almost like a San Francisco <laughs> yep. uh, resident. Yeah. But uh, yeah, you're, I got you while you're in town. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to introduce yourself, tell the audience what you do and why you're here? Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm Lee. I'm the VP of Developer Experience at Vercel. And uh, I'm super excited to talk about all things open source, talk about Next.js, talk about Vercel, the web, um, lots to get into. Yeah, yeah. And we can start with like, how did you get into just web in general? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've I've been infatuated with the web ever since I first made my first basic HTML website, especially when I got exposure to mobile apps. Okay. I, and I saw the beauty of you just push the HTML document out and it's live. Like the process of getting code online was so much easier than mobile apps. It really it just made me so excited about the web how easily I could share with my friends. So I got into web, really loved it, spent most of my career doing product engineering work, and then eventually stumbled on this little thing called DevRel, which for me felt like a good combination of all the things that I really loved. I loved coding, I loved writing, I loved creating, whether that's videos or you know, other related creations, like I love music as well too. It's like combining all of these passions into one thing DevRel allowed me to express, yeah, and that kind of led to where I'm at today, working at Vercel, um, leading our developer experience organization, which is uh, kind of a combination of DevRel and as well as documentation. Okay, excellent. And uh, you mentioned music. Do you play music? I do. What do you play? Yeah, I play guitar, drums. Uh, I'm a very average singer. It's fun to fun to do okay. still. Yeah, I'm pretty average singer myself. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've got my own personal Beyonce cover band in my nice. basement. So <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, technically it's just me singing <laughs> covers of Beyonce songs. Shout out to Renaissance, which will be coming out after this has been, <laughs> actually before this airs in the next couple of days. So yeah, shout yeah. out to that. Yeah. But um, yeah, so you said you got in the web. Mm -hmm. So was this like in college or mm -hmm. high school or was this like, when yeah, did that happen? I, I actually was doing graphic design work in high school and I, I loved like illustrator and creating these like vector images and I helped like design t-shirts. Really? Um, yeah, I really liked for like for bands. <laughs> um, not actually for bands. It was mostly for like sports teams or local oh, projects, nice. which was cool. Um, Give it back to the community. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mentioned that because before we hit record, uh, I don't know if you don't know West Boss's story, but we were talking about syntax because you were just on there. Yeah. Uh, West Boss used to design band <laughs> band logos and album yeah. covers. So. It's so cool. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, I, I got into graphic design. And I mean, if we go if we go way back, I used to like get it when I was, I played a lot of video games when I was a kid. And I used to, I would make graphic design like signatures in your forums. You know, like you like the little like yes, banners I'm, I'm down very the bottom. familiar, I'm not, yes. Yeah, yeah. And I would do like, you know, video clips of me playing video games and like record them and edit and all that stuff. So I'd always been into like the video editing, photo editing side of things. But then, yeah, coming out of high school and into college, I was like, hmm, do I want to do graphic design? Do I want to do something else? And like point blank, I was like, I'm going to try engineering. I feel like it's my best chance of getting a job. Like I just purely went on the practical play. So, you know, first year of college, I started to learn how to code and it was, you know, it was pretty overwhelming at first. I had no idea what I was doing. I was just kind of picking up as I went. And it wasn't until we started getting into web development that I was like, Yes. Yes, it makes this sense. This is it. Like, I wish yeah. we would have started with this. So you're from Iowa. Did you go to Iowa State or Iowa? Yes. Yeah, Iowa, Iowa State. State. Yep. Okay. That's the Cyclones? Yes. Excellent. Yeah. I went to the University of South Florida, so they mm -hmm. were in our division. Yeah. Now college. they are, though, I think. I yeah, think are they USF back? is in the Big 12 now, I think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I just honestly don't pay attention to USF sports anymore. I don't, I don't <laughs> watch as much sports as I used to when I was in college or university. Yeah. I used to love it. Yeah, well, you're kind of busy now. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah. flying to San Francisco once a month, so <laughs> yeah. at least at least once a month. Because mm -hmm. I've seen, I feel like I just, just saw you mm -hmm. <laughs> like a couple weeks ago. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so in college, studying CS. Yep, computer engineering. Computer engineering. Okay, well, yep. pretty close. S yeah, same thing. And uh, got in the web development. Um, I guess what did you do after college, or how did you get into sort of this uh, the web dev career? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in college, I did a few internships at different industries to try to figure out what area of software I was yeah. interested in. Because at the time, with a computer engineering degree, they kind of give you 
both the software and hardware track. Yeah. And it's like, all right, like choose your path. And I was more, I gravitated more to the software side, but I didn't know what area of focus in software I really wanted to do. I just knew that the web was exciting. And so I did a couple jobs at a couple different, you know, different sectors. And I really liked the SaaS space, um, classic technology company space. And was doing, you know, mostly product engineering work, did some internal tools work. I did some like productivity team work. I did classic product team shipping features, did some tech lead, like just kind of juggled a bunch of different product roles. While at the same time, I realized that in building, when I would find something that didn't exist, I was like, I should just put this online. Like, why does this not exist in the world? Like somebody needed this. Yeah. And that started with a blog post or just like a really simple, you know, I was trying to find this react error and I couldn't find it. So here's how you solve it. Like, here's how you, one of them I wrote a long time ago was like, how do you print a page with react, but it's actually a different page that you iframe in. Yeah. Which is like a really weird use case, but I couldn't find a good article for it. So I wrote it. And then that slowly just progressed to like making full courses and making videos on YouTube and just going all in on making stuff. And at the time I was just scratching my itch of like, this is fun. I'm, I'm enjoying helping other people learn more than anything else. And then the satisfaction of people reaching out and be like, after watching this video, yeah. I finally make sense now. I finally get it. And then I was like, wow, okay, education is actually something that I'm really passionate about. Yeah, yeah. And shout out to your your Next.js course, the, the Mastering Next.js, because yeah. that's how I learned Next.js. Nice. I had, I've known Next.js since the beginning, mm -hmm. but I didn't actually have a use case to use it. You yeah. know, didn't really care much about routing because all of my stuff was just like one single page apps, just quickly got components on the page. Mm -hmm. And then when I needed to build something in Next.js or just understand it, I'm like, oh, I need, I need to find a course or walk through and I think I discovered through your YouTube mm -hmm. that you had Next.js content and then yeah. eventually pointed me to the Mastering Next.js course, which yes. I think is also still on YouTube. Yes. Um, but I wanted to zoom back real quick before we get into all this like Next.js content. Mm -hmm. When did you first time touching React? Like how did you discover that? First time touching React was 2014, I think. Okay. Um, so new-ish, but to be honest at the time, like I wasn't super I wasn't super great at front end development. So I remember entering in this like React ecosystem at the time and being very confused. Yeah. Uh, there was just a lot going on, a lot to understand, not only in React, but in like the surrounding ecosystem. Yeah. What, what mental model were you coming from? Did you do PHP prior yeah. or anything like that? So yeah. then PHP wasn't familiar with the JSX and. Yeah. It like, for me, like the NPM ecosystem okay. was like a little overwhelmed. Like, that would have been pretty confusing. Yeah. It was like getting, getting up to speed with not like the, not the happy path, but when things went wrong, yes, it was so confusing at first. So my introduction into the, the React space was a lot of figuring things out for the first time. But then once it clicked, it really clicked well because of the, the UI abstraction that React gives you. Like once I started thinking in components, yeah. then I was like, oh, this is the way. Like yeah. this is, what have I been doing? Uh, yes. I just had to get over the initial hurdle of complexity, like the barrier to entry of the ecosystem, which it's kind of, you know, funny, like foreshadowing into where I'm at today and like why I really like Next.js is like it was helping lower that barrier. Yeah. And I think that's what's huge about this is that the the barrier of entry to even get anything on the web back in the day, it went, we went from, it was super easy to do HTML mm -hmm. and super easy to inject PHP in plat, like random places. Yep. Uh, and then jQuery made it super easy. And then we had this complexity that came through with like these bundlers and build tools and mm -hmm. NPM, which you, you cited as well. Mm -hmm. If you don't have that context, if you're like, you know, I have JavaScript I want to run in the browser and you're like, oh, I can't just run this random node package that I found. Yeah. Like that blew me away when I, I 2014 is actually when I first started touching React as mm -hmm. well uh, at a job. And I had no context because I was doing Ruby on Rails prior. Yes and had no context on how to properly write JavaScript. Because yes. Rails also abstracted that from me mm -hmm. uh, in the way that I think I think was beneficial for shipping and, and becoming an engineer and getting in the industry. But when I needed to like shift into JavaScript full-time, as a lot of us did mm -hmm. in 2014, 2015, um, I had to like learn <laughs> from the ground up. And yeah. It was a perfect time because as 2014 came around, that's when we like had, well, 2015 is like, I think we're in the class structure came in the React and it was like easier to sort of like produce that mental model. Your yes. JSX just lived like the render mm -hmm. uh, method. 
And uh, I felt like it was easier at that point because I, I tried doing the React a couple years prior, and I was like, ah, this is dumb. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to stick to ERB templates. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, like, what were you doing before React then? Yeah, PHP. Um, I explored Ruby on Rails a bit. Okay. Yeah, it's I, there was something very satisfying about like the jQuery HTML vanilla JavaScript world. Yeah. Cause then for me, like being in, involved in that, like, you know, I, I don't go back as far like learning to code in 2011. Like yeah. I don't go back as far as a lot of other, other folks I talked to. So I was coming into this with like a completely different past experience than some others. So then jumping into the, the, the JavaScript fatigue ecosystem at the time yes. was a big jump for me. Uh, and it took me a little while to wrangle that complexity. Yeah, it's a, you know, complexity. And I realized like you, you currently co-worker with Tobias from Webpack. Yes. And like Webpack is when I finally got it, mm -hmm. but also I didn't get it. So yeah. like I, I knew enough to be dangerous in Webpack because I did the whole Webpack from scratch. I did like a lot of tutorials, started doing workshops myself, teaching them mm -hmm. at, at conferences of like building Webpack from scratch, mm -hmm. which is like, shout out to Ken C. Dodds. Like he's the one that got me into like the start from zero mm -hmm. and uh, learn it that way. And uh, a lot of his courses start that way as well. And I, I guess what I'm getting at is like, it was like a, a blessing and a curse, which was Webpack. Cause then I got to the point where you're just like, man, I'm, I'm too dangerous that I don't know how to fix this. Yes. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I actually discovered you through YouTube. Yes. Um, through your course. And uh, you, we actually just talked about, I asked you if you still did YouTube and like, the answer is like, kind of, I yeah. guess. In, a, in an ideal world, I would be putting out so much more content because there's lots of stuff I want to talk yeah. about. There's lots of things that I feel like I can give a, a new perspective or a new take on. It's just the forcing function of getting the video out, like putting the words on paper or putting the, recording the video and getting it shipped. I'm trying to force myself to do more of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like what brought you to the master? So what I found you, which is yep. mastering Next.js, what brought you to build that course? Yeah, so I would say this was probably, this was probably 2017 going into 2018. Um, at the time, you know, we were using React at my job and we were doing custom server rendered React. You know, roll your own Webpack, roll your own Babel, what everyone was doing, right? Yeah. Um, and... I was starting to really grapple the complexity of that and what worked and really what didn't work. And as we onboarded new engineers and we tried to scale the team, there was this overhead of trying to train everyone up on the custom solution that we had built. So then about that same time, I think 2016 was when Next.js came out. At first it was, you know, pretty experimental, I guess. It was like, oh, yeah. this seems cool, but we'll see what happens. And fast forward a couple of years, it started to get some some real adoption. I was like, okay, 2018. I'm like, well, let's give this a shot. Let's see what it would actually look like to move to a framework on React that abstracts away me having to think about build configuration, bundling, compiling. I just write my code in the pages folder. It maps to a route. I don't need React Router. I don't need any of these external libraries. Yes. It's just just the pages folder. And then it was kind of returning to your PHP roots in a lot of ways. And critically, it was server rendered by default, which was really important at the time working in e-commerce. Yeah. We needed that well, for SEO. It, it solved a lot of, because server-side rendering in React was extremely complicated at that time. Yes. So Next.js came through and solved it in a way that was like, just set it and forget it type of deal. Mm -hmm. Like routing's built in. You don't even have to rewrite code front end, back end, and mm -hmm. stuff like that, or API and, and client. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of the reason why I never used Next.js is because I didn't have that problem a lot of my side projects. But now in my current side project, my current full-time project is like, it's a problem now. I know it's a solved problem. Yes. And I can walk into, and the, the, actually I mentioned this, whoops, I just hit the, uh, the mic. Um, I mentioned this to you in passing, maybe when we met in person or something, mm -hmm. maybe on a call. Like one of the things I love about Next.js is that it has opinions mm -hmm. that if I say, hey, we're going to build this thing in Next.js in Tailwind, everyone knows what that means. So mm -hmm. if I say, hey, we're hiring for Next.js and Tailwinds, which... And like, if I said I was hiring for a React dev, that could mean so many different things. Oh man, yeah. But if I say next JS and Tailwind, we're gonna ship a product really quickly, everyone knows what that means. Mm -hmm. And I can hire pretty easily. I, yes. I was actually, a lot of my side projects, I contract. Um, if I know I can get like the scale, skeleton up or the design out, mm -hmm. I know I can contract for like the rest of it. And uh, that the secret sauce for a lot of my video content on YouTube was I contracted all the example apps. I was yes. like, hey, here's the, like the, the sort of one library that does the thing. So like socialcarding.com is one of my sites. Mm -hmm. uh, I built, 
I built content and never shipped it. And I, I tried pawning it off to James Q quick as well. It's like, Hey, take this, take the site. It works like use it for your content. And, uh, he got busy as well. Uh, but what I'm getting at is like, I built the idea of put a URL. It's like Twitter card preview is a site. Yep. I use it all the time. I'm like, I just want to see if the social card works. Mm -hmm. I want to test the social card. And, um, so I built socialcarding.com just to put a URL, see if the social card works. What I do use a lot of it for is like downloading YouTube thumbnails from mm -hmm. other places. Mm -hmm. uh, Cause I can just drop a YouTube link, download that YouTube thumbnail. Uh, but what I'm getting at it's a next JS app tailwind. Yes. And I built the prototype and then I had someone polish it for me. And, uh, I just honestly could not be happier with just two frameworks and it'd be enough to prototype for. They both have strong opinions, loosely held kind of like they have yeah. strong opinions, but they're also extensible. Like if you want to customize Tailwind, you can do some wild stuff. Yeah. Like you can make it look completely differently. And same way with Next.js, the default experience has some guardrails on what you can and can't do. There are ways to extend it though. Like if you need to eject from the default web pack, config and, and kind of build your own or include some plugin, you can. Most people don't have to do that, but it's an yeah. option if you need to. And I think that really helped with adoption in the beginning, I think yeah. as well too, because for, for folks who were migrating over from their custom Webpack or Babel setups, they weren't ready to give it up entirely. They needed to make the incremental adoption a little bit smoother. And that's remained a core fundamental philosophy for how we build Next.js yeah. to this day. Yeah, and it, it, honestly, it's needed in the in industry because yeah. at the time Next.js came out and all these other frameworks came out uh, on top of React, we needed to centralize on at least something because yeah. Facebook, Meta, they all made the decision of like, we're just going to solve some problems for us. Mm -hmm. We'll share share some secrets for everyone else to learn from, but like, feel free to like report back, come to our conference, talk about it. So then like a lot of folks remember like back in 2014 when Facebook unveiled Flux mm -hmm. and they're like, Hey, or it was actually 20. Yeah. It was 2013. like react came out. Actually, I'm, my ears are off by one it's, probably. It sounds right. But flux, was like, Hey, we solved a problem with notifications. Here's the flux pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, have a good night. And then what happened was everyone, everyone adopted, <laughs> everyone <it>. adopted <laughs> the flux pattern in a, its own library. Yeah. So I think there was like 84 implementations of flux mm -hmm. in the, the, at the time, it was a Slack. It was called Reactiflux. I don't know if you're part of that Slack early mm -hmm. on with Gabe, um, but Reactiflux was a Slack because there were so many Flux implementations. It eventually became the React Slack. Yeah. But it was it was really yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, but it started because Flux was such a hard pattern to copy from Facebook mm -hmm. that everyone had its own style. Eventually, Dan Abramoff and Redux and that team got that one to be adopted because it was like the wasn't the easiest pattern, but because like Redux was still challenging back in the day. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess what I'm getting at is like that war of like, we need people to figure things out in the open and then we can centralize on like the path moving forward. And I think that's what we're seeing right now at the web. Absolutely. Uh, where yes, Next.js is now making it easier for the base layer if you want to get a site up and running, which I was talking to, um, man, it was a, uh, one of the connections I got through Theo, mm -hmm. uh, there's a nonprofit, mm -hmm. um, oh, URad.com. Nonprofit doesn't the the I guess the CEO leader of the nonprofit didn't know how to write code, ended up building his own site because he couldn't actually get any contracting that was affordable. Mm -hmm. Learned Next.js in like thirty days. Yes, I and love built this story. his site. And because the, the the base layer is like the pattern is like okay pages. Okay, mm -hmm. let me just change the page to what I think it should be. I'll learn this later, but at least I can get something deployed. And then obviously with Vercel, perfect pattern. Mm -hmm deploy the Vercel, it just works. There's mm -hmm. no like SRE, there's no like web manager that you have to talk there's to no your agency. Team. It's like, yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's like, if that's the way we can we can get people on the web as fast as possible, we can now get more people on the internet, like we, everybody wins at that point. Mm -hmm. So I, going back to the, the open source story, like these frameworks, these stories, these things that we have discovered, we're now standing on the, the shoulders of giants at this point. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a it's been a wild ride since the beginning of Next.js. You know, when I was first getting involved in the community, like yeah, 2018 ish, when I started to adopt it uh, for for my job. At that time, I it just seemed like a great solution for the problem I was having. But then during the implementation of it was when I started to realize this is still pretty new. Yeah. There's not a lot of good resources out there yet for people who are going down this journey. And that was kind of my opportunity to say. 
I want to make an impact on this community. If no, if this isn't here, I'm going to be the first person to create it, yeah. which kind of led to the course creation, led yeah. to the blogs, led to me kind of becoming an advocate for that community and ultimately funneling back into working at Vercel and continuing yeah. pushing that forward. What's the story with the, the Vercel job? Yeah, I mean, I had been, I had been creating content, just being a part of the community for a while. And then, you know, I had, had gotten contact with the team there. Coincidentally, it was, it was two years ago, we were planning for the first ever Next.js conference. Yeah. So we had never done one before. We knew that we wanted to create this event to really get the community together and celebrate all of the open source contributors and celebrate some of the new features we had been launching on. But at the time, the Vercel team was very small. You know, there was about 30 people. So, uh, you know, and talking to the team, then they're like, we need to hire more people. This is, yeah. a, this is an ambitious effort. And to do that, we want to scale out not only the community efforts, but also the content efforts. And it made a really good pairing to try to find somebody from the community yeah. who was already doing a lot of that work. I, I recommend this all the time with startups. Absolutely. If you're looking for your first dev rel, your first community manager, look at your community. Because there's probably someone who knows your product well enough that they could talk to it, to customers, to free users, mm -hmm. to whatever it is. And uh, that's awesome. I'd and, and also people who've lived the life of your ideal customer. Yeah. So like I had lived the life of, I had my own custom React setup. I migrated to Next.js and I knew the the woes of self-hosting my own yeah. Next.js app as well. Like there was some good parts. There was also some really challenging parts too. So I was able to take that experience, kind of funnel it into the Vercel motion. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, um, I, I wanted to shift gears a bit and I want to ask a question that everybody wants to know is like, yeah. are you going to hire everybody in open source? <laughs> Probably not everyone, but I'm I'm very happy with the amazing team we've started to assemble and the investments we've been making in not only like actually investing money in open source projects and helping towards their growth, but then also hiring folks to continue working on yeah. projects. So, for example, we you know we sponsor projects on Open Collective, just a general giving back to the community to continue yeah. funding growth. But then you know more uh, like larger investments, hiring somebody like Rich Harris to work on Svelte full time is just amazing to me because of how incredible this felt project is and enabling open source to have the full-time contributor to just work yeah. on it as their main gig instead of a side project at a, a company before is like, it's a, it's a, it's something I'm really excited to be part of at Vercel. Yeah. yeah. And maybe this is a saucy take too as well, but like I've had conversations with Evan Yu mm -hmm. and Evan, a lot of folks don't know, Evan actually started working more regularly on Vue when he was working at Apollo. Mm -hmm. And uh, Apollo actually chose. He was he was writing React code during the day mm -hmm. and writing Vue code at night, to the point where like he ended up taking the time to like st do the Patreon. The whole story's out there, but did the Patreon now when he does Vue full time. And I wonder if it would be a different story for Apollo if they invested in Vue, which honestly like you don't know what's going to happen or where this project's going. But like with Felt, mm -hmm. that was a project I've seen around multiple times. I know exactly what I'd use Felt for, mm -hmm. um, but I also wouldn't. Well, before hiring Rich Harris at Vercel, uh, I don't know if I would have re reached for Svelte for like a a day to day production mm -hmm. site that I had to depend on. Because mm -hmm. if I had to migrate that, I've been there as well, yes. where I had to migrate off like all these other frameworks that don't exist anymore. You get confidence knowing that there's that support and that backing yeah. from a company that's demonstrated that it cares about open source. Yeah, that was part of the reasons why I actually ended up choosing to join the Vercel team because you know at the time, like I said, there were yeah. like thirty people. You know, really like one of the first startups I've worked at. So I'm like, do I, do I want to join this team? Is you this, made a good is, bet. Is this risky? I'm not sure. Yeah. And ultimately what it came back down to is I trusted the founder. I trusted the leadership team and I believed in the mission and how much they gave back to open source was like a critical part of me and what I like out of the software ecosystem. So I, when you look at Vercel, it's, it's like the 20th most starred GitHub organization and Next.js has 90,000 stars. It's like the 30th most starred repo yeah. on all of GitHub. Which yeah, yeah. Is wild. <laughs> yeah, of all the projects that are over 40,000 stars, it's 2,300 projects. Wow. So it's actually, it's just a small cohort yeah. to make to that level. Uh, and there's projects that have been around for so many years that haven't crossed over 50. Like, like stars is not the best metric. Like, yeah. obviously, uh, I might be building a tool to provide insights in the mm -hmm. open source to identify stuff better than stars and green mm -hmm. squares. Uh, but what I'm getting at is like Vercel, like you you have a track record in just the CEO alone. Like Guillermo started with open source, yeah, and absolutely. he's been like I I use socket socket IO is actually part of my open source origin story. That's awesome. Yeah, because actually the tool that I I wanted to build was um, which is a common occurrence right now today. What mm -hmm. when Slack came out as like the the full on Slack product, 
you had to invite by via email to join your Slack team, mm. which was a, literally a team, your, your group. So what I'm getting at is that I wanted to auto invite people to Slack. So the way I did this is I found on GitHub, there's an open source library um, called Slack Inviter or something like that. And uh, it was powered by Socket.io. Mm. And it was built as an example for Socket.io. <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know all this until like, like years later, but I reached out to the maintainer and was like, hey, I don't know Node.js, but this is a problem solved for me. How do I use this? And uh, he ended up un unblocking me uh, while like backpacking to Thailand. And I was like, wow, I am forever grateful to this guy for teaching me how to Node.js works and how you can actually run stuff. Yeah. Because it was like during the um, pre-ES 2015, ES6, uh, it was like IOJS mm -hmm. and there was, there was Node.js and very confusing for someone who just now only knows JavaScript and now yeah. like, like talk about world. your NPM thing, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so then anyway, uh, what I'm getting at is like open source is in the core ethos of Vercel, which you had mentioned. And now there's a, there's a pattern of now you have the Webpack maintainer, you've got Spelt. Mm -hmm. um, well, you have Malta who mm -hmm. was working on Chrome. Yep. Um, Turbo Repo. Turbo Repo. Yes, that's yeah. right. Jared. And uh, I mean, Jared <laughs> himself has many amazing. Yes. Tons of stuff. Yeah. 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 I've, I've been following Jared for a while actually. And, mm -hmm. um, it's funny, I've never met Jared or talked to him before, mm -hmm. but I've definitely seen him around. I've listened to his podcast with Ken. I don't know if he still does that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, Turbo Repo is like an amazing solution to a problem that a lot of people have when mm -hmm. like managing packages and, and large projects. The other day I tweeted uh, a list of software that folks at Vercel have either created or maintained open source software. Yeah. And I sent it out to our engineering channel. like, hey, is this, this is a list look accurate? Because I wasn't really sure. And then people responded with like 50 that I missed. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> uh, my bad. <laughs> I just didn't realize how many there were. The, the list is just, it's mind blowing. Like some of the bedrock of web infrastructure, like packages that people rely on millions yeah. and millions and millions of times a day. Yeah. And did you, did you create that list manually? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. wish there was a tool that helped me do that. Yeah. Only if there was, <laughs> uh, we should probably do that. Also, I think Scarf actually, Scarf.sh could probably accomplish that to the, to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. uh, so if worthwhile, probably checking that out. I think it's still a free platform. It used to be a JavaScript library. Now it's got way more bells and whistles. Um, but yeah, I, I honestly think I wouldn't be here based on my story. I would not be here without open source. If it wasn't for folks, the early sort of paving the way in the React ecosystem, people I've reached out to asking questions. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned before off before recording, I, Michael Jackson was a person who I did React training. Mm -hmm. And uh, he taught the React training course, changed my entire perspective mm -hmm. on how to write React code. And um, now they're working on Remix. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those patterns that they were teaching for years are now in the Remix library. And uh, I think the, I'm very bullish on React, uh, but I'm also b bullish on web. Yes. And uh, I was curious, like what are the most exciting things you, you see that are being shipped now? It could be Vercel things or also just yeah. web general. Yeah, the web is in a great spot right now. I think cross browser adoption has never been better when you look at whether it's CSS or yeah. browser features like lazy loading images, like. All of these things are getting better support across major browsers, as well as older browsers being deprecated or not being used as much. And then there's this return to standardization of APIs. And when you look at this subset of web APIs, you're now able to use these not only in the browser, but on the server side as well. Too. Yeah. And that gets me really excited because you learn it once and you can write it everywhere. Yeah, the, the whole, um, what, Node 14, 12, I don't know why I know this number, probably because I contributed to it. Um, but with the ESM, mm -hmm. inclusion of ESM, now you can you can import rather than uh, common JS. And mm -hmm. like talk about confusion, like brand new engineer writing JavaScript. Now you have to know if you need to import, why does this work on the server the same Some way it works? Some packages on the... use common JS. Yeah. Some use ESM. I get this weird error when it's yeah. like not compatible. Yeah. Yeah, and then now I think even... The, the amount of TypeScript, like libraries now onboarding in TypeScript makes it so much easier to now even like VS Code, I can understand what I can pull from an API or what can I can what sort of patterns I can introduce into my my application. It's um, honestly, I, I wish I had all this stuff when I was learning how to code like Same. ten years ago. Yeah, because I was I was just on Stack Overflow all day, and mm -hmm. now I can do, find a YouTube channel or a random clip and be like, oh man, this is that's a weird pattern. Let me implement this into my app or hey, there's a solution to do some random scraping of Google Maps API. Like mm -hmm. 
everyone like there's so much solved problems out there and i think the discovery thing is the fun funnest part is like discovering stuff and funnest is not a word but i, I realized that but uh, we'll <laughs> yeah so the funnest part is like discovering new ways for people to, to do things like even the um i actually did a course with next.js and blockchain Nice. So actually doing a um, NFTs back when it was popular last summer, <laughs> uh, I did a whole course. I prob- I shipped it probably too late because I didn't actually publish it in the last. Um, so in the series, like four videos, the last video I think I shipped in like December, January. Mm-hmm. And it was like months away from like everyone seeing everything go down. Yeah. But it was a fun process because I think the Web3 space has so many unsolved problems there. Yep. It's exciting space. There's lots of money in it, apparently. Maybe there's not any money in it. Who knows? But it's an exciting space because now you can solve problems like caching and how do you actually ingest four gigabyte NFTs? Mm -hmm. Like there's a, that's a problem that folks have solved like through Cloudflare has been generous in solving this problem by with this, uh, their caching solution. Obviously they, they're a VC backed, like they're a public company actually at this point. I always forget they went public. Um, but what I'm getting at is like, there's so much opportunity to like go, go find your, put your boots on and go find your space to where you can sort of operate in the web. Yeah. And I mean, I learned best by building. So yeah. like trying out projects like that and just going into something, I have no idea what I'm doing yeah. and stumbling through it is actually how I feel like I progress the most. That's one of the things that's been exciting about being at Vercells in the, you know, I've been there for two years now. It's, it's been, I've learned so much in the two years. Yeah. It's been quite an exponential change. I bet. I mean, the growth of just next JS alone, mm-hmm. like just seeing, because the one thing I, I think that you can't discount is actually trying things and mm-hmm. early in its like infancy as a product, uh, which I, I kind of wish I tried Next.js earlier, but here I am today. Mm-hmm. But as you grow with it, so I, I grew with React and I was able to see how it sort of expanded and like how problems were solved. So I don't, I'll be honest, I don't quite understand hooks all the time. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, uh, use effect. Okay, that little uh, array at the end of it. What mm-hmm. am I supposed to do with that? Eventually, I figure it out once I re-render the page 60 times. <laughs> but it's a, it's a thing that I, because the muscle memory is there, I'm like, I'm so comfortable and I'm familiar with it. And the beauty of that is like, you don't have to be me, like eight years of React experience. Like you can just use Next.js. Mm-hmm. It was fun, it's funny you're talking about how like you wish you would have learned Next.js earlier. And depending on how bullish you are in Next.js, <laughs> like you still are early. Yeah, <laughs> this is true. This is very true. Which, I, is, which is funny because when I look at it, it's, I, I felt I felt early to it, but at the same time, I'm so excited about the next five, ten years of Next.js because I'm also really excited about the next five, ten years of React. When you look at the adoption curve of React on the web and you contrast it with like a jQuery or something, it's it's wild. There's still so much more room left to go. There's so many folks who are moving to React and rebuilding their websites and trying to update to use the latest tech. And for a lot of them, like they might end up exploring Next.js. And if they do, then there's lots of opportunity there to help them grow. Yeah. And you mentioned graphic design early in your career trajectory. Mm-hmm. Did you ever use any of the coding tools from Adobe back in the day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dreamweaver was interesting. It was kind of, kind of similar. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like where what Vercel is doing successful right now and what Adobe sort of missed out on is that it was all closed ecosystem. You had to pay for even like Flash or all these other tools. I forget what their um, their coding platform was, but you had to pay a license mm. to use their, their their code, to like their framework. Yeah. And like where Vercel, and I, I think when you, you talk about, you corrected me, like this is only the beginning for Next.js. And I think because it's such an open ecosystem, like there are opinions, but you take contribution. Yeah. And people can also build on top of it. So we saw Blitz build their framework on top of Next.js. We saw, um, actually is Redwood.js on top of Next? Nope, but no. it, you can use Redwood's backend as like an okay. API generator. And you can Next. use the client of Next, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. There's over 2,000 contributors to the project. Yeah. And it, it's funny, we, we just shipped a patch release and there's like 36 contributors to it. Like wow. for a, a one-off patch release, which is really fun because- How do you manage that? Well, big kudos to the the Next.js team and the you know core contributors and those who help with triaging of issues for I think building a community like that takes a lot of dedicated work yeah. and intentional work over many years, even when it might not seem like the payoff is obvious. But they've been so focused on making it an inviting place for folks to contribute their first PR, to update the readme of an example, to you know make a one-line change even, which is kind of how I got started contributing yeah. to Next.js. Like I was just updating read me it's like i joked because on the like github sidebar it shows like the top contributors and i'm like 
four now. Number four, I'm like, all I do is ship example updates and like yeah. one line of code changes to the library, but yeah, I, I, I don't deserve that. <laughs> so in, in the uh, insights platform that we're shipping for open source, uh, Next.js is my example. Whenever mm -hmm. I talk to like a new person who's interested in this, um, I, I see your name and I, I always see like Markdown next to it. And I'm like, oh, cool. Some more documentations here. Big Markdown guy. <laughs> but actually one thing that I, I see a lot is like between releases or in some PRs, like, there's some large sweeping changes. And like, what I need to actually do is make a distinguisher of like who's in the org and who's not. Mm -hmm. We haven't done that yet. Mm -hmm. But like, there's a lot of like interesting performance, like updates and like the Webpack config, it's like a large sweeping change. And I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I would love to be a fly on the wall on this like roadmap meeting and like how to get that. Yeah, merged. it's it's tricky too, because you want to make these big changes that can impact a, a large number of customers, but then at the same time, respecting that they might not be able to upgrade right yeah. away. So having that incremental adoption approach ingrained from the start, even looking beyond semantic versioning, like even with shipping a minor release or a major release, still making the upgrade path as seamless as possible has been one of the things that I'm really glad we invested in because I hear from customers, no joke, who upgrade from Next.js 4.0 yeah. to 12 and wow. they have minor changes. They have to rename like the, the static folder to public yeah. and they have to change like one config option and then it just, it just works. There's not like a CLI tool that people maintain to we migration. Do have, we do have, um, we publish code mods for okay. some of the easily scriptable upgrades Got where it. it's like, Hey, we removed this prop and we added this prop with this next release, just run MPX code mod. Yeah. I think my, um, actually that's not true. My, I was going to say BW live is on next. And I was going to say it was like nine, but it's technically 11. Cause I remember being at next conf online and, uh, upgrading yeah. <laughs> after the announcement. Yeah. And like, I gotta you know, go upgrade. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to watch this talk, but also upgrade my, uh, my next site. So, mm -hmm. uh, it was actually a pretty decent experience from going from nine to 11 back in the day. Um, and obviously we're in 12 for our current product that we're working on, but yeah, quite the, it's, it's a very, very nice, elegant experience. And like I mentioned tailwind and, and next as a combo. Like we always we leverage a design system with Storybook, mm -hmm. like that also makes it easier for us to like walk components to different projects as well. Yeah, um, yeah. That's honestly reusability. Uh, we do get a lot of contributors as well, not as much as Next.js, um, which I, I'm curious how many are outside. Do you get a lot of outside contributors? Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, I would say the majority of folks on board to contributing through example or docs changes. Got it. Yeah. But then once they get in the flow of making a change and getting updated and like getting onboarded and getting that positive feedback. Yeah. We see a, some of those folks come back and actually make, they'll pull an issue and they'll do an actual change to the core library code as well too. Yeah. And that's how we've helped get some really amazing community uh, contributors as well. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to eventually making contrib contributions upstream. Uh, yeah. I've been a little busy, uh, but Definitely, I've definitely made some contribution up to other frameworks, mm -hmm. and I'm a big fan of onboarding people in open source. So I, I actually personally just want to see what the experience is like, mm -hmm. uh, so I can steal some ideas for other projects and hopefully future content. Yeah. So the one thing, the honestly, the one thing that I have actually put a lot of thought into mm -hmm. is around uh, tech debt. Yeah. And uh, I, tech debt in because uh, I've I've talked to Babel um, a couple years ago. Uh, Henry mm -hmm. specifically, mm -hmm. and talking about how many versions of Babel that are supported, but also Babel has to support so many different versions of Node.js mm -hmm. as well. So, the the idea of Next.js, like how do you how do you keep the community moving forward? As mm -hmm. far as like I mentioned, I'm on Next Nine mm -hmm. on on some pro. Actually, I'm still on Next Nine on some projects because you know, you ship it and you forget about it, and then one day you're like, oh. What, no, it'd be cool adding a new feature here. Yeah. Oh, actually, okay. never mind. <laughs> I'm going to go yak shave <laughs> version, yeah. versioning through Dependabot yes. instead. Yeah. When you look at the kind of the burn down chart of versions, at any point in time, there's like 50 versions of Next.js out in the wild, whether it's major, minor, patch releases, canary releases, all the way back to Next.js 5, up to Next.js 12 or in the yeah. future 13. And when, when you realize that, it's kind of a sobering moment to think about all the different people in the wild, in the community building with different iterations or different forks of your code. So it's very important that we're intentional about what those upgrade paths are. We talked yeah. about code mods, which is a really important one, but I think before the code mod is what's the life cycle of a feature. Yeah. And you have to be very intentional about when you bring a new feature in, knowing that it's going to be around for a while. Yeah. Because if we introduce a new feature, you know, we write docs about it, we talk about it that's going to be around for multiple major versions. 
just upgrading to a major version doesn't necessarily mean, or at least our philosophy is that there's going to be a bunch of breaking changes. Um, there might be some, but ideally they can be automated away or the impact can be lowered. So for example, we recently did over the past couple major versions, some major core architectural changes in the foundation of Next.js. Yeah. Like we, we, re we rebuilt the plane while it was flying. Uh, we, <laughs> Perfect. That sounds easy. Yeah. I mean, kudos to the team. They, they did an incredible job. We, we basically swapped out the compilation engine for a new Rust-based system. But at the same time, Babel is extremely popular. And there was many different versions out there that were still relying on this. So the, the life cycle of a feature is essentially alpha or experimental enabled through a flag where you can opt in in the config. Let's try this out. Let's get feedback from early, uh, early people in the community and see how it's working. Then eventually in a pat or in a minor release, we can actually start advocating for it and telling the community about it. Hey, just so you know, there's this experimental feature. You can now use the SWC uh, compiler to make your local dev experience much faster. Yeah. So then more people try it out. We get some bug reports, we iterate on it. Then finally we go to a major release and depending on the, the severity or the impact of it, we may or may not flip that on for everybody in the release. So like, for yeah. example, the Webpack 4 to 5 migration, there was so many changes that we really wanted to make sure there wasn't this ecosystem churn. Yeah. So even with a major release, we're like, hold on, we'll still let people uh, incrementally like uh, opt into this. It okay. shouldn't be an auto opt in. They should they should be sure that they're willing to opt into this world instead of just upgrading and everything breaks. So it's like being really intentional about those conversations. It's, it's tricky and it, it requires a long-term view of the maintenance, but when done right, it, it provides a really great developer experience. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of thought that goes into that sort of, you know, orchestration or changing the airplane, um, <laughs> like yeah. changing out the engine while you're flying yeah. on it. <laughs> is that because now Vercel is just a mature company? You have PMs now, you've got massive amount of engineers that can now attack this problem? Is that helpful? Yeah. Part of it's too, just the, the sheer number of companies that are relying on Next.js, not only for yeah. sell customers, but also folks who are self-hosting Next.js and using it in production, just massive websites who are still depending on us to make it a stable platform. Like yeah. the, the ideal goal for me is you update Next.js, you don't have to do anything. Your site gets faster and more lean. And that, that's the, that's the goat. Like that's the ideal yeah, yeah. state, right? Yeah. And that's, um, you know, you, you, you mentioned the term self-hosting next to It's like, I'm like self-hosting. <laughs> yeah. People, a lot of people don't realize how much yeah. I think about that. Cause they yeah. think, well, you work at Vercel, like you're advocating for Vercel. You probably don't think about that. It's like, no, I'm, I'm leading the Next.js community. I care deeply about everyone yeah. who's using Next.js, even if they're on their own self-hosted Kubernetes setup, which yeah. a lot of people it, are. It's a, it's a common setup for developers. So mm -hmm. if you've already scratch that itch or you already have an AWS account that you can just auto deploy things. Um, it, it's hard to switch if you already know how to do this, but like for self serving other customers besides just developers, like you got it. Yeah. Large, like huge moose heads on the, on the page uh, of nextjs.org. Mm -hmm. um, but I was going to ask the question of like, is there a future of like a, a nextjs cloud? Like where you don't actually, well, I guess you can, you, you do have a feature where you can edit. It's like the live feature. Yeah, we've been thinking about what the what the future of collaboration on yes. top of frameworks looks like. Because on one hand, you have in-browser IDEs, which are trying to provide every feature of your local editor and kind of yeah. have parity there, whether it's Git pods or stack blitzes of the world, yeah. right, or code spaces. Uh, and then on the other hand, you kind of have you know, just kind of these quick review edits where you just want to make small changes to code, more in line with almost an inline suggestion on a PR or like a yeah. small edit. It's like, hey, the line height is off here. Like just maybe let's change the CSS a little bit. I feel like we're leaning more towards that side, like how we can make the review and the uh, like the UX review almost of the different yeah. content that we're publishing in your UI, make that a seamless process. Um, so that's that's something I am excited about. It's it's reducing the barrier for collaboration. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that because um, I take a lot of contribution on one of my sites uh, for hot open sauce type pizza. Mm -hmm. And uh, we get contribution from all the places. Like we just had a CSS change that basically broke mobile. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we had another personal attempt to do it as well. I'm like, Hey guys, keep breaking mobile. Uh, but it's something that like, no one's really thinking about it. Cause you're on your desktop. You're your, like just doing this. Like, Oh, I forgot mm -hmm. to check this on another browser, mm -hmm. but to be able to like pull up a Chrome Safari brave or whatever, and, and do that sort of live edit, that would be, 
pretty valuable because a lot of times, man, there was a, I was working on a site at GitHub mm -hmm. and we had this weirdness be between Chrome had shipped a feature where if your API doesn't have the same URL, you had to do some weird security things because GitHub is very, we got to have to have, make sure everything's secure, mm -hmm. uh, but it would break on Brave, it break Safari. And, but we had to have an API that ingested into a GitHub page because mm -hmm. that's just, that's the tools we had available and uh, extremely painful because I didn't yeah. have Brave. Well, I had Brave, but I didn't have all these other browsers to go test on. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, I got to download these browsers. So it'd be cool to be like, hey, can you share your screen? Pull up on the browser you care about the most, mm -hmm. and then we'll live edit together. Yeah, it's something we've been working on for a while at Vercel is like what what the right layer of collaboration is on top. Yeah. Like the, one of the first iterations of this that we have beta customers trying out is essentially around the, I get my team on a preview deployment. They want to be able to collaborate, add comments, add screenshots, give feedback essentially, and figure out how we move this PR and move this change forward so that we can kind of feel good about these UI changes, merge it to main and ship the thing to prod. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is fascinating stuff. And like, this is all on the back of open source to be exactly. Yeah. Quite frankly, cause like there's not a lot of the stuff that Vercel is working on is just not proprietary stuff. I've, you probably have some private repos for sure, mm -hmm. but like you mentioned SWC, I mm -hmm. remember when that thing was shipped and I'm like, Oh wow, this is, this is amazing. Yeah. And like, even like the stale wall re revalidate SWR, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is a, uh, these acronyms or a, I use NCC a ton mm -hmm. for GitHub Actions yeah. back in the day. So all these like small little packages and libraries. My favorite one is MS, which is a, it's a very small, like a couple hundred, you know, hundred, couple hundred line file millisecond utility formatting library. It's used by like 10 million people. Really? I think it's like the 10th most installed package on NPM or something. Wow. It's, it's wild. And it's, you know, it's just formatting milliseconds into something easier to read. Wow. Okay. Yeah, we have a library at open source that we haven't published yet, which it's it's all problem most people have done where you take like the thousand. So we have a lot of stars. Mm -hmm. So take ten thousand stars and make it ten K. Yep. Like we've rebuilt this, we've tested it, it's been proven, and now we just use it everywhere. Mm -hmm. And eventually we'll get on an NPM. But yeah, this see like small little problems, mm -hmm. throwing them out in the ether, solve it for somebody else. Yeah, it's it's funny because little things like that, it's not even the core of like what our product is at Vercel, yeah. but open source is so critical to our, our ethos and what we stand for that we still have all these packages over time where if there's a way for us to open source a part of what we're building and give it back to the community, we do it. So for example, you know, we have a new open source package coming out soon that solves a problem that we've grappled with a lot, which yeah. is really how you wrangle creating screenshots for open graph images <laughs> yes which is that's uh that i that's social carding like yes that's what i was it's trying hard. to accomplish yeah it's really hard and we've been grappling that for many years we've used it for a lot of our projects and we're like there's got to be a better way to do this how can we build something and kind of give it back to the open source community yeah i'm, I'm pretty happy with where we landed i'm excited to talk about that more soon but it's just yeah. it's a hard problem i i will definitely be embedding into my next js site <laughs> to basically generate screenshots of websites. Because I the, the goal of social carding, it's like a completely side project. I don't have a lot any time to do this. Mm -hmm. But when I do find time, I'll go crank out some code. And I want to be able to have like, um, which is not the problem that you're solving with this, but uh, kind of like Bitly for social cards. Mm -hmm. Like if I can create a social card on the fly mm -hmm. and then like go share that, see if it works as far as like using a very custom URL mm -hmm. uh, and then go add that to my just like the generation of generating social cards on my my blog, my next JSI, whatever it is. But I just want to test it first to see yeah. if like, is it clickable? Mm -hmm. uh, and I want to be able to hot swap it out to see if it's not working, hot swap the image. And that's what I'm working on as like a fun side project on Sundays. Cool. Well, I, I, honestly, I feel like we could talk forever to be quite honest, but uh, I'm super happy to finally sit down with you, have this conversation. Cause I don't think you've been on, oh, you know, I, we did invite you to the, um, the floss and code you did yeah. present there yeah, that at, was fun. on GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was actually, we got intro from Thor. Yeah. Yeah. So that probably wouldn't have been our first meeting mm -hmm. ever. That, and was that was about, a couple that was years like ago. A, yeah. That was like a year ago, maybe. Time yeah. flies. Yeah. A spoiler alert. Like we want to rebuild floss and code in open source. Nice. Um, and continue to give back to the community. So we might actually have an event in a couple months nice. uh, with the open source brand. So. Hopefully, I, I'm saying it now, so we got we have to do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm publicly committing to it. So. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. Well, thanks so much for hanging out with us, yeah, and uh, you. yo, everyone who's watching, like and subscribe, and uh, stay saucy.